It's Law Talk with BJ, the podcast where trial attorney and legal commentator BJ Bernstein and her guests discuss the latest issues from around the legal world. BJ is a frequent commentator on television and radio. She's unique in that she not only comments on legal issues, having been lead counsel on numerous high-profile cases of national interest, but her relatable personal style allows the viewer to understand the law behind the headlines and why it's important. Now, here's your host, B.J. Bernstein. Law Talk with B.J. has now recorded over 40 episodes where my focus, of course, is law. I have shared with you the many voices and participants in the legal system, from lawyers in the criminal and civil justice arenas to the judges in the trial and appellate courts. There is, though, another aspect of law, and that is the lawmakers themselves— the legislators who pass the laws that govern and that are tested and enforced by the courts. On May 19th, 2020, there will be an election to determine who will be the Democratic nominee to the United States Senate, who will run against the current United States Senator, David Perdue of the Republican Party, and they will battle it out in November. Over the next few weeks, you will hear directly from several of the candidates running for the U.S. Senate Democratic nomination, including Sarah Riggs Amico, John Ossoff, Ted Terry, and Teresa Tomlinson. These podcasts will allow you to meet the candidates and hear their own voices, their goals, their views on the critical issues and the laws that are passed. Do not take anything I say with each candidate as a personal endorsement. I, of course, as I've done with other political podcasts that I've brought to you, am intentionally not making any donation or endorsing any particular candidate so that I can bring to you their voices, their vision for Georgia and the nation. As we know, it's critical that we get out there and vote. If you haven't registered to vote, the time is now as you're listening to this to make arrangements and get that registration done and then plan to vote on May 19th, 2020, if you are going to vote for the nominees for the U.S. Senate. And recall that on May 19th, 2020, you're also going to be voting for some judges who have been the subject of other podcasts. So with that, take a listen and let's meet one of the Senate candidates. Welcome to Law Talk with BJ. In this series, you are meeting the candidates for United States Senate that are running in the Democratic primary that is on May 19th. 2020. And I have joining me for tea and a chat, Sarah Riggs Amico. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, BJ. I'm happy to be here. So I want the audience to know who you are. There's obviously some basics. You're 40 years old. You are a mother um, and you're in the business world. Um, You are executive chairperson for a family trucking company, Jack Cooper. Um, you, your education, I'm just going to go ahead and put all that stuff out there in front of us. You have an MBA from Harvard Business School, quite impressive. And you went to undergraduate at Washington and Lee University. So those are all the little ticks that we mark on when we look at somebody. But there's obviously a lot more of, you know, what you stand for and why you're running. So let's start. Why are you running for U.S. Senate? And what do you hope to accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2018, I had the incredible honor to be the Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor here in Georgia, uh, running alongside the inimitable Stacey Abrams. And I was a first-time candidate for office. Uh, and to be clear, I don't think I had any clue what I was getting into. Uh, I don't think that anybody running for statewide office for the first time probably does. But it was a remarkable and richly rewarding experience. I went through about 150 counties in a little less than a year. I met folks in every corner of the state who welcomed us into their living rooms, told us their hopes and dreams for the future and for their family or their children. And at the same time, they shared their heart about their fears. What happens when they lose faith in the kind of leaders we elect to office? And I think, you know, the Senate, the U.S. Senate right now, probably more than any institution in Washington, D.C., um, has taken a dramatic departure away from its character. The Senate was meant to be the grown-ups in the room, the place where grand bargains were made and the interests of the country as a whole were well represented. 
and to sort of have that longer tenure and balance um, the the political whim in the House of Representatives. It was meant to be this great balancing act. And instead, I think what we see now in the U.S. Senate under Mitch McConnell and his leadership is obstructionism. Time and again, you know, the Democratic House of Representatives has passed more than 400 bills, and there are just hundreds of them that sit on the dust of Mitch McConnell's desk. Uh, he calls himself the Grim Reaper for a reason. He's refused to take up issues ranging from universal background checks, which the majority of Americans, including a majority of gun owners and Republicans, support, um, ranging from universal background checks all the way to pension relief. Um, so for me, you know, in 2018, I saw a lot of the the goodness and the kindness and compassion of the people of Georgia. And I think the longer I was on the trail, the more I saw that contrasting with the kind of leaders we have in the U.S. Senate. Um, Stacy and I came up a little bit short. My view is we had a little bit of help along the way from some rampant voter suppression here in our state. But we still got, uh, I got more than 1.8 million votes, 470,000 more votes than David Perdue's ever gotten and more than any Democrat in the history of our state for lieutenant governor. So when Stacy decided not to run for the U.S. Senate, gosh, uh, this is probably the job I've wanted since I was 12, to be honest. My high school graduation program says, you know, here's Sarah's grades, and here's where she's going to school, and here's what she wants to be when she grows no up. No way. And mine says U.S. Senator. It says U.S. Senator. <laughs> it does. Right. It does. So, you know, I, I think um, I had a vision of what – uh, what leadership could look like if we prioritized working families, making sure nobody's poor because they're sick or sick because they are poor, um, you know, making sure that there's a check on a trade war that no one will win, but that our workers and our farmers and American consumers are losing. And, um, you know, the opportunity presented itself, it's deeply personal uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. I'm very proudly married to a naturalized American citizen. Uh, so I have two little girls. One turns nine this Friday, and the next one turns seven, eight days later. Which means by the time you're listening to this, they've had their birthdays. Then I will have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old by the go. time you're listening. Um, you know, they're very proud that we mix languages and foods and cultures in our house. And I don't think that makes them less American. I think that connects our family to centuries of what has made this country a remarkable place. So that personal experience, what does that do in terms of your um ideas or thoughts about immigration? Well, I mean, I think our immigration system is deeply broken. And, and worse than that, it's become um, a political hockey puck, right? It, you know, people seem a lot more interested in pandering and maybe even fundraising for some folks off of this. David Perdue authored something with Senator Tom Cotton called the RAISE Act, which literally targeted cutting legal immigration in half. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about that. If, God forbid, something ever happened to my father-in-law, I don't think my mother-in-law, who's a retired kindergarten teacher, 74 years old, doesn't speak a word of English, she's not coming for your job if she wants to come and live out the rest of her days next to her son and her granddaughters. Um, I don't think of that as chain migration. I think of that as keeping a family together and doing the right thing. So as a business owner, by the way, I've been very fortunate. I've worked with winners of the green card lottery. I've worked with naturalized citizens. I've worked with political refugees. Um, I've worked with dual citizens, and all of those people brought a unique perspective to the table and made the discussions deeper and richer, but also made the business better. And um, in fact, 45% of the Fortune 500 were founded by immigrants or their children. Um, they have always been a part of contributing. And, you know, unless you're 100 percent Native American, somewhere along the line, you were either an immigrant or your ancestors were brought over here as enslaved people. And so I think reconciling with that part of our history, finding something that balances economic growth with um, our values, who we are as a country, the welcoming place, uh, the shining city on the hill, that's, uh, that's what I'd like to see more of. I'm going to take a shift over to something that's in my lane, obviously the legal part of this podcast, and a lot of our listeners listen because they want to know more about the justice system in general, both the criminal and civil justice um, system. Uh, do you have any certain policies that you want to focus on if you become a senator, particularly with regard to criminal justice reform? Yeah, absolutely. So I just got back from a five-day tour of the Georgia coast area, a lot of time in Savannah, Brunswick, even a little bit inland in Dublin and Metter and Hinesville. And 
um, a lot of what we were doing were meeting with constituencies talking about criminal justice reform, whether that was local nonprofits or clergy um, for across denominations and religions or activists and organizers on the ground, the people who are doing the work all the time, even when it's not election year. Uh, and my view on criminal justice is very straightforward. We need to remove the profit incentive from our criminal justice system. And that so privatized prisons. They've got to go. I, look, I, I may be doing a politics, but I've been a business executive for almost 17 years. And I can tell you that the prerogative of a business is to grow both the top and the bottom lines. And if you're running a business of a prison, that means incarcerating more people and providing fewer services. Um, we've seen here in the state of Georgia by the state's own research that those private prisons are not more effective, cost effective in administering justice. And more importantly, I'm deeply concerned that a profit incentive in a private prison diverts the restorative nature of our justice system. It takes the focus into the private enterprise and away from how we can welcome returning citizens successfully into our communities, uh, minimize recidivism, and make sure that we're giving justice. Nothing more and nothing less, not justice plus a profit. So yes, private prisons, uh, I do not support. I also don't support cash bail. Um, I'm very interested to watch, you know, based on some of the work the groups around the country have done, including the Bronx Freedom Fund. Um, the research is now showing that not only are people pleading to crimes they didn't commit simply so that they don't lose their job or their children or their housing, um, or they end up on probation and then pay monetary payments along the way on probation to try to stay out and which could go to other things. Correct. And my understanding is that Georgia has more people on uh, probation and in the criminal justice system, relatively speaking, than almost anywhere else in the United States. And so from my perspective, cash bail, private prisons uh, have to go. But there is a third piece to that. And I think it's particularly important here in Georgia, which is prison labor. You know, we have prison labor camps all over the state that use inmates as free labor for everything from cleaning golf courses for wealthy folks um, or even public golf courses to trash collection, which in other circumstances might be really high quality union jobs that provide an on-ramp to opportunity in the American dream for families. I'm a strong pro-labor candidate. I'm the only candidate in either U.S. Senate race who has a union endorsement. In fact, I have two. Um, I've created and saved thousands of union jobs. In fact, my business, we grew from about 100 employees in 2008 to about 3,000 now. Uh, in fact, um, 2,200 of those were Teamsters and Machinists. They were the best partners we had in the business. And the summer when we got caught in sort of a multi-employer pension crisis, we went through a very painful restructuring. And I sent, spent my summer saving those 3,000 jobs. In less than three months, we managed to save all the jobs uh, without a single wage cut, we're still paying 100% of our employees' health insurance premiums, and we save thousands of pensions. And, and not to be negative, but to tie into what's been in the news, that you the, your company had some bankruptcy issues of recent. And this oh, is the things right. that you've done to readjust um, as you're going through that process, or you've cleared the process now? Oh, the process was cleared months ago, actually. Okay. Um, this was what they call a prearranged. So it is a prearranged restructuring. It falls under Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code. Um, we had a choice. Um, to be honest, we probably could have muddled through for another few years. Um, but we are part of the Central States Pension Fund, which is the next major multi-employer pension plan that will collapse in the United States in 2024. And if we waited and the federal government didn't act, all 3,000 of those jobs would have gone away. In fact, the House patched the Butch Lewis Act. Mm. Um, I was at the Teamsters Hall in Washington, D.C. the day that passed the committee in the House. And they sent it to the Senate. And just like he's done with hundreds of other bills, Mitch McConnell refused to take action. In fact, he not only didn't take action, he dismissed the Senate into recess. He went on vacation rather than look out for working people's pensions. And so our second choice, you know, number one was cross your fingers and pray a lot more that the federal government gets its act together. And let's be honest with the current guys in charge of the U.S. Senate, that's not likely. Um, or you could go through a restructuring process that did involve a bankruptcy filing um, and you could fix it. And here's the difference between me and David Perdue. We've both had businesses that went through a Chapter 11. The difference is at Pillotex, he spent nine months working at the company. He came in actually after the first bankruptcy as the turnaround guy. And in nine months, he took more than $1.7 million in compensation, fired more than 7,000 people in a single day, 
and then quietly sneaked out the back door with his little bag of coins and nobody knew why until a few months later when they filed for bankruptcy again over, guess what, a pension issue. So, Mm -hmm. you know, in this year's election in November, I believe you're going to have a choice between that or the woman who knew, who knew she wanted to run for Senate, nevertheless stayed and in less than three months saved 3,000 jobs, thousands of pensions, all the health care, all the wages, and fixed it. And I did it at my own expense. The way we got that deal done is my family gave up every dollar of equity that we've invested in that business for over 11 years. Um, The way I was brought up, the leaders are supposed to take the pain. You're supposed to lead by example. You're supposed to be the one that puts everything on the line to protect the people who are counting on you. So uh, I hope we talk about this issue more. Um, The reality is we successfully exited the restructuring. uh, And actually, months later, so about a week ago, I stepped down officially. I don't know that that's public yet, but I suppose it will be now when people listen. (laughs) That's right. um, To run full time for the U.S. Senate because I know how important these issues are. And I want to go to Washington and be a part of fixing it, not just for the 3,000 families that worked for me, but for the 1,400 multi-employer pension plans around this country, the millions of families counting on them, and for working people all over this nation. Let's move to another topic, hot topic always, health care. Um, what are your positions there? Um, what do you seek to improve? Um, there's always, um, you know, this battle between those who, you know, you know, Medicare, Medicare for all, Medicare for some, you know, getting it through your employer. There's a whole lot of different ways um, that different candidates look at health care. What are yours? I always start with a value statement. So first and foremost, this is 2020 in the United States of America. Nobody should be sick because they're poor or poor because they're sick. Very straightforward. I'm the daughter of a former NICU nurse who worked with some of the most vulnerable um, you know, citizens of this country, right? The, the premature babies back in the 70s in St. Louis, Missouri. We were just brought up to believe that. I believed it so much as a business executive, we paid 100% of the premiums, still do, for our employees. Um, so for me, I think that I love the idea that we have universal coverage in this country. I think the Affordable Care Act, which is part of the reason I became a Democrat, uh, I'm not a lifelong Democrat, but it was the health care issue that brought me over. Um, I think the idea of having universal coverage, nobody going without, is a very good thing. Now, how do you get there from a policy standpoint? I'd love to see us go to a public option. Um, I think that would bring a lot of competition in. It would drop prices in the private insurance market. I would like to see an expansion of the safety net so that more people are covered by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, And I'd like people to be able to buy into it if they like. Uh, You know, health insurance wasn't meant to be coupled with employment. Uh, That's something that developed in post-World War II America because there were restrictions on how much salary compensation employers could give to their employees at that time. And giving them health care was another form of compensation that was still allowed to be added to the pot. Um, But it means, you know, I meet people all over the state who are stuck in a job that um, they either are miserable at or they don't want to be a part of or it isn't what their passion is, but they can't figure out how to get insurance for their kids if they're an artist or if they start that theater troupe they've always wanted or the small business that they've dreamed of. So I think not only would it make American workers more competitive, you know, our business had operations in Canada. And when we went out to bid contracts, um, we didn't have to worry about whether or not we were price competitive because we chose to do the right thing and provide health care for folks. In Canada, it was paid for. So we were on a level playing field with every other business. And um, not only will it make it more competitive, but I think it will unleash economic opportunity and potential for all kinds of people who would love to start that business, but they just can't for fear of leaving their kids without health insurance or themselves. Let's talk about the economics and the various things that different ways to deal with taxes and other things that, um, you know, obviously everybody feels like at times that the taxes are onerous and how they're used. What What is your tax policy that you would try to seek to um, or is there anything you want to change a more immediate so many things. Um, okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's such a broad question, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got the corporate side of it um, and you've got the individual side. So I think maybe that's the best way to break down the question. Okay. On the corporate side, I think it's disturbing to me as it is to many Americans of good conscience that there are largely successful 
profitable, multi-billion dollar businesses that effectively pay zero taxes in this country. There's nothing about that statement I just said that is just, um, that provides for the economic security of the workers that make those business possible. And look, I, you know, I have a Harvard MBA, right? I'm, I'm a former business owner. Um, I'm about as far from socialism as you can get. I know the Republicans are going to talk a lot about that, but it, it'll be comical to watch them try to make that stick for me. Um, but I do believe that they need to pay their fair share. I'd like to see the tax code simplified. I'd like to see us uh, cut out a lot of the loopholes, um, especially in the corporate side, and at the same time be competitive in the world. And by the way, you can do both. Like this is not an either or. That's that's something that people only believe in politics. In the real world, with the rest of us creating jobs, we know that there are ways to accomplish both of these objectives. On the individual side, you know, I think in cre the research that came out at the end of last year that said for the first time in our history, working families paid a higher effective tax rate than the top 400 fam wealthiest families in the country it was really disturbing. You know, if you invent a cure for cancer, if you're Bill Gates or Steven Spielberg, I hope you are fabulously wealthy. Uh, you know, I hope that you are able to achieve your wildest dreams and that we continue to incentivize that kind of American entrepreneurial spirit. And at the same time, I want you to remember where you started and to pay a fair share of taxes um, that you're able to reach not just back, but to help pull other people up. And I think if you look at, uh, you know, if you were looking at America as a business and not a country, right? I mean, probably not a very good idea in most circumstances. But if you think about where we're investing, it tells you about our priorities. If we're chronically underinvesting in the health and well-being of our people, if you're chronically underinvesting in infrastructure, if you're chronically underinvesting in public education, you know, you would short that stock over the long term. There are real investments that we need to make that will pay a return, but a return on investment presumes you make an investment. So we've got to start being more realistic about um, how we can smartly and in a very targeted and strategic way invest in the future prosperity of this nation and its people. And I think that's going to start with a conversation about fairness and taxes. So as we get time goes by fast and we're sitting here talking and but I, so I want to give you an opportunity is there's something else or any other policy or part of what's compelling you to run that you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, you know, for me, it's interesting. Um, we're building this campaign on three primary pillars. First and foremost is increasing access to affordable health care. I've, I've met with people all over the state who've gotten a surprise bill from a hospital uh, a month after they left an emergency room, right? It's the only product we buy in this country where you don't know the price until a month after you buy it, right? Uh, nobody would buy their groceries that way. Um, so increasing access to affordable health care, making sure that our families have the security they need for students, you know, my daughter's age, to succeed. If you show up at school and you're hungry or you can't go to the doctor when you're sick or you can't get eyeglasses so you can't read the chalkboard, you're not realizing your God-given potential. You're, you know, you're stuck in that cycle of poverty. So increasing access to affordable health care, including the expansion of Medicaid here at the state level, strengthening the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, adding a public option, you know, moving towards true universal coverage. Uh, those are the things that really hit my heart. The second pillar is economic security. That includes protecting labor and organizing rights. Uh, unions have always been not only a part of the on-ramp to prosperity and the American dream for America's working families, um, they've been a part of making sure we have a safe work environment. They've been a part of making sure pay equity was a real thing, right? Women had pay equity in union jobs long before they had it anywhere else. Um, so I'd like to see that economic security and justice. And I think that is going to require some very uncomfortable conversations around race. Uh, the reality is we haven't made nearly as much uh, progress in equity as people would like to believe since the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, this has never been a perfect country, but we've always tried to move forward in progress. And until that progress and access to opportunity is equally available, no matter what the color of your skin or who you love or how or if you pray, we're not there yet. And so economic security is big for me. And the third and final one we haven't talked about is voting rights and election security. What happened in Georgia 
uh, in 2018 was... It, much litigation. In fact, we've had some podcasts on the election litigation. Some of them around Georgia. my race in 2018, actually. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, what happened here was stunning. You've got a U.S. Senate majority leader in Mitch McConnell who literally doesn't think we need election security laws. You've got a president who intermittently does or does not believe there was foreign interference in our 2016 election, despite the universal consensus of his own intelligence community. Um, you know, we've got to take this stuff seriously. Your right to vote, whether it's equally accessible, you know, to one person as it is to the other, literally determines whether or not we can address all these other issues we've been talking about. If we don't have equal access to the ballot box, if we have people in predominantly African-American precincts here in Atlanta waiting three and a half hours in line, while in some, you know, more suburban areas, you've had 20-minute lines in predominantly white precincts, you had missing power cords, you had all sorts of issues, absentee ballot rejections, you know, in Gwinnett County alone outstripped the statewide rate by almost five times. If you don't have equal access, it's a little bit like taking the steering wheel off of one of my trucks driving down the highway, right? You can't control all these other factors that you need to. So I'd like to see federal election security laws. I'd like to see an update to the EAC standards around voting machines. Um, and I would certainly like to see the full restoration of the Voting Rights Act. I think the Shelby decision um, was a disaster in the South. We saw more than 1,000 polling places close, including 214, I believe, here in Georgia. And, you know, disproportionately, again, impacting rural, poor, and minority communities. It's unacceptable. Uh, Preclearance still stands in the laws. You know, I'm not an attorney, but you are. Okay. Um, but they did get rid of the formula. So my view is we should go back in and within the boundaries of the Shelby decision, recodify a formula that works and make sure that we are restoring the protections for communities that have been historically disenfranchised. Well, thank you for sharing everything that you are passionate about and you're feeling. And as we close out this episode of Law Talk with BJ, we've been enjoying a cup of tea that I choose that's appropriate for each guest. And I always have a hunch. And then I love that... Um, you have nailed it. I picked the perfect one for you. And this is raspberry leaf tea. It's the only ingredient in this is raspberry leaf. Mm. Um, and it is actually historically um, given to women, particularly around birth, for because for strengthening. And there's a lot of cultures that feel like raspberry leaf is for strengthening and self-actualization and making a strong, positive um, peace and care for the world. So if you do get this job, I hope that maybe you'll think about the raspberry tea and, it, and let it infuse how you um, lead and govern. So thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. This podcast is not to be construed as legal advice. With any legal issue, you should reach out to a professional attorney that practices law in the state and area of law for which you need information or consultation. Law Talk with BJ does not establish an attorney-client relationship, which is only formed when you have hired an attorney and signed an engagement agreement or contract. It's Law Talk with BJ Music Theme, written and produced by Atlanta Audible. This podcast copyright 2018, BJ Bernstein, Esquire. <laughs>